Hello, and welcome to Things We Said Today, our bi-weekly podcast about anything and everything to do with the Beatles, collectively and individually, past, present, and things to come. I'm Alan Cozen, the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop, and Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything, and co-author with Adrian Sinclair of the forthcoming McCartney Legacy series and also a writer about music and musicians for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and several other fine publications. I'm joined by my esteemed co-hosts, Ken Michaels, who you know is the host of the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing, and a co-host of the Solo Beatles podcast, Talk More Talk. He also has his own YouTube channel packed with Beatles-related interviews, uh, which he'll tell you how to find at the end of the show. Hello, Ken. How's it going? Great. Good. Hello, Alan. Hi, Darren. Looking forward to this topic. Yes. Mm. And also Darren DeVivo, DJ at WFUVFM 90.7 in the New York area since 1984. Darren's been there since 1984. They were there a little earlier. They were there, yeah. They, mm. Since 1947. Mm. Wow. Is this and where I say hi? If oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> you can say hi, but hi. I was going to point out that if you're not hey. in the vicinity of New York, you can hear him and everything else at WFUV at WFUV.org. So, hey, Darren. Howdy. How you doing? Uh, <laughs> welcome to another show. And hello, Ken. Hello, Alan. Okay. Today, we're going to talk about Paul McCartney's lyrics book. Or books. Mm -hmm. I threw my back out <laughs> lifting it when I got it. <laughs> yeah. um, and I'm sure we'll have uh, all of us a lot to say about it because there's an awful lot in it and there's an awful lot not in it. But first, we have news from Ken. I love that tease you just gave there, Ellen. There's a lot not in it. <laughs> and we'll tackle that when we uh, have our main discussion on it. But there is a ton, and I mean a ton, of Beatle news. Since the last show that we did, we decided to forego the news. So much has accumulated in the last several weeks, it's hard to know where to start. But I will start with the news that a long-lost recording that features both George Harrison and Ringo Starr has been found after 53 years. This never-before-heard song called Roddy Sham was written and produced by broadcaster and journalist Sur uh, Suresh Joshi for a 1968 documentary film, East Meets West. The song was rediscovered by Joshi during lockdown in his loft in Birmingham. He, he told BBC Merseyside a friend helped him find the song and it was played on their station before being previewed to a hundred Beatles fans at the Beatles Museum in Liverpool. The original recording took place at Trident Studios in London, with the pair adding drums and guitars to Hindi language vocals coming from Ashish Khan. Joshi said he met George and Ringo when George's interest in Indian culture was at its height in 1968 after the Beatles went to Rishikesh to study Transcendental Meditation. Joshi said with that, about George, we started talking about philosophy in general. And as for the song, Joshi uh, says, the song itself revolves around the concept that we are all one and that the world is our oyster. And he says the song is still relevant to this day. He says that is something we have all realized during this pandemic. Would you guys like to comment about the song? I certainly think it has like a psychedelic sound to it. And once you listen to the guitar playing, you know it sounds just like George, and mm. the drumming sounds just like Ringo. I thought very, the drumming very... sounded like Ringo. Yeah, not so much the guitar playing, but but the drumming I detected Ringo. Uh, am I the only nut that questioned whether or not it was authentic when I heard it the first time? Probably not. Have you heard? Have you guys seen anyone else questioning? Sure as heck, sounded like a really good recording for 1968. Mm. But I could be wrong. It's a studio recording, so um, I've, I've seen people question whether it's George. Um, sorry, and I've seen, 
And I've seen people, uh, someone mentioned that um, Clapton is supposed to have been on it too, but um, I would think that they would have mentioned that if that was the case. Uh, so who knows? It sort of, it sort of reminded me of uh, a couple of really cool bands, uh, 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 Corner Shop and Cooler Shaker, who have kind of done things that sound a little like that. Hmm. Um, I thought it was a pretty good song. I just, again, I don't know why I was a little like, oh, now it turns up. Mm -hmm. I was a little skeptical, you know, who, uh, and I'd not recognizing any names. And does it say where it was recorded? Did you say, uh, Ken? Just Trident. Trident. Just Trident. All right. Well, that would work. Yeah, I've heard it was, it, was it possibly, it possibly was recorded the same time as Hey Jude around that time. And uh, but definitely the drumming sounds like Ringo. Yeah, this kind of fills. But I think the the guitar playing sounds very Georgish. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it was like more obvious that it was Ringo playing drums than John playing than George playing guitar. Uh -huh. I think, and I kind of zeroed in on that. Um, I listened to it a couple of times on Spotify. But I don't it's fascinating. It it's fascinating that we hear about this stuff, and you would have thought we know everything that any of the Beatles have done in the studio, especially yeah. during that time and all the documentation that's out and all of Mark Lewison's research. And mm -hmm. this is the first we've mentioned Chris Englehart in, in his uh, books about things the Beatles have done for other people. True. Just yeah, goes to show you, you never know when something could turn up. That's sort of what fed into me wondering, gee, this nobody's ever heard that anything like this happened. And, the names involved weren't remotely familiar. Like there's not like one musician whose name we stumbled upon. But hey, you know, I'm just going on, you know, hunch and and. Yeah. Um, I also don't know the full story behind this film, because no right. matter what, if it was me, I would have put this out in 1968 just because of the names that are on it. So the other thing why that's did it take all this long? Yeah. And these in, in an instance like this, now I am somebody that has a lot of stuff. I collect a lot of music, a lot of CDs, and I have been very, very hit and miss with keeping things organized. But if I had a recording or if I made a recording with a couple of Beatles on it, I would know where it is and I wouldn't forget about it. That's true. This sounds like this guy did this session with two of the Beatles and forgot and forgot where they put the tape. Even I know where some, some things are, you know, it may take me a week to get to that part of the room, mm. but um, you know, it, that, that part of it too, like, oh, like, my friend found it in my attic. Okay. So we have a lot of news, you say. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's move on here. Uh, the Beatles Let It Be album, which returned to the top 10 a few weeks ago at number seven takes three big drops since then on the billboard charts to number 42 then 84 and now at 116 let's all hope that once get back is on disney plus that will reinvigorate uh interest and sales and let it be mm -hmm. 60 minutes ran a piece on the upcoming documentary of get back premiering next week on disney plus with interviews from peter jackson and giles martin either of you want to comment on it there's also the um, uh, Extra 60 piece. Minutes Overtime piece yeah. uh, online that adds another five minutes or so um, talking about using, uh, he didn't say spectral, so I'm not sure he's using spectral per, per se, um, but talking about how to sort of take you know, mono recording and, and separate strands of it. Um, what he didn't say in this interview, but has said in other interviews, is that they used it on the famous lunchroom tape, which was everyone know what the famous lunchroom tape is. Um, the, uh, they were, I think the day George walked out on uh, January 10th, um, there were some discussions going on that he knew were gonna be interesting and they, uh, we're going to have them over lunch. And so he, uh, Michael Lindsay Hogg, bugged a flower pot or something, uh, put a microphone in there to record lunch. And uh, if you've heard the tape, it's among the Nagras. Uh, 
it, it it sounds just like clatter of silverware. That's really mostly what you can hear. And he was able to, using these techniques, separate the voices from the clatter of tableware so he could hear what was going on. So um, presumably he's telling us this because some of that's going to be in the film. Um, there's no video for it, but, uh, but there may be some audio that they could use. And uh, so that was the interesting thing about the overtime part. Uh, the 60 minutes part itself was, was interesting. Um, one th thing that was really interesting to me is um, you probably know, remember I've uh, mentioned probably way too many times on the show that one of my favorite bits of the uh, Nagras is when Paul says, you know, oh, I've got it too. Uh, Jojo left his home in Tucson, Arizona. And John says it's Tucson in Arizona. And Paul says, yeah, it's where they filmed High Chaparral. That scene's in there. That means presumably it's going to be in the Get Back film. So I'm really happy about that because that's a moment that, that shows them actually coming up with a line and the discussion about the line. And then it's the line that we all know, which is, you know, great. Mm. So, um, so there was that, that was the high point for me. I was sitting there watching 60 minutes. And just said, yes. You know? So anyway. Well, it's obvious they're listening to you, Alan. And yeah. That's influencing what's going to turn up in the film. They're listening to our show, you know. Yes. <laughs> Maybe we can get them to shut up about this if we just put it in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Paul and daughter Mary McCartney attended the UK premiere of Get Back at Cineworld Empire. And that was on November the 16th this week. Ringo Starr, don't know if you know about this, Ringo was about to teach a master class on drumming with an online course on drumming creative collaboration. The course will start on November the 22nd. Ringo will be involved with the company Masterclass, which is an online education subscription platform which aids underserved communities. David Rogier, the founder and CEO of Masterclass is quoted as saying, Masterclass puts you in the room with the world's best giving members, um, uh, unprecedented access to the greatest minds of our time. If you want to know more, just go to masterclass.com. Just in time for the holiday season, brand new George Harrison merchandise is now available, including an exclusive crew neck and limited edition five ornament set featuring George and his famous gnomes, recreating the classic album cover for All Things Must Pass. Also available, puzzles, pins, vinyl, CDs, t-shirts, and more. Just go to store.georgeharrison.com. All right, we go back a bit here, all the way back to October 30th. The Rock and Roll Hall of Fame ceremonies. Paul McCartney gave the induction speech for the Foo Fighters. In his speech, he made the parallel between his career and that of Dave Grohl, and how they both had to face the sad endings of their first band and then have success all over again with a new one. At the end of the night, the Foo Fighters jammed on three of their songs, and then Paul jammed uh, with them singing Get Back in a version that was pretty faithful to the original. Ringo Starr, live from his home in Beverly Hills, inducted Billy Preston. Now, the show will be broadcast on HBO, on November the 20th, that's this Saturday, and it will stream on HBO Max. Okay. Um, November the 18th, that's this Thursday. Hopefully the show will be up by uh, Thursday. Paul will be interviewed live on Barnes & Noble's YouTube page to discuss the songs from his new book, The Lyrics. He'll be talking about those songs with the CEO for Barnes & Noble, James Daunt, and that will start at 7 p.m. Eastern time. Although, just like just, a, just about everything else that ends up on YouTube anyway. Um, also, this Friday, the 10-inch vinyl version of Ringo Starr's latest EP, Change the World, gets released. On November the 5th, Paul was interviewed in London for his interview at South Bank Center for his book, The Lyrics, which I think we'll talk about more you know, while we're discussing the book. You Discover Music reports that Paul McCartney's handwritten lyrics, along with photos and more items from Paul's personal archives, will be going on display at a new exhibition at the British Library in London. 
The exhibit will explore the process and people behind some of Paul's iconic songs. On display will be the handwritten lyrics for Hey Jude, 1985, Pipes of Peace, and Jenny Wren. A drawing that Paul made for the single for Put It There will be featured, as well as an early Beatles set list, a postcard of the Beatles in Hamburg, and George Martin's score for yesterday. Uh, this exhibit is actually running right now through March 13th next year, and admission is free. The Guardian is reporting that George Harrison's childhood home, a three-bedroom terrace house at 25 Upton Green in Liverpool, uh, is about to go up for auction this month with an estimated price of between 160 and 200,000 pounds. The house has been renovated, but still retains some of the same features when George lived there. And that includes the original bath sink and other outbuildings. The Harrison family movie, uh, the Harrison family moved there in 1949 and stayed there for 12 years. It was George's base as he started his first forays into music there, met Paul McCartney on the bus to their school, auditioned for the Quarrymen, and joined the band while living there. Omega Auctions will be selling the home, and that will be on November the 30th. There'll be two weeks prior for anyone that wants to schedule an appointment to view the home, and that means now as you're watching this. All right. I said this in my other podcast, but that doesn't sound like a lot of money. <laughs> Considering this was George Harrison's home, 160 to 200,000 pounds. What is that? It's about $300,000. A bit less. Well, yeah. It's but surprising. It's, right? So it could, oh, it could go higher. It could go yeah. crazy. Hmm. All right. Deadline reports that a new documentary film is in the works on the life of the late keyboardist and singer, Billy Preston. Billy was one of the most beloved and sought after organists, and he played along uh, greats such as Little Richard, Ray Charles, and of course, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones. The TV director, Paris Barclay, known for his work on NYPD Blue, The West Wing, and Glee will be the director. Barclay said, the Billy Preston we know was an incomparable musician, but the Billy we'll see in this documentary was a mass of contradictions. I'm thrilled to dig deeper into the complex man under the afro and behind the famous smile. Just happy to see anything done on Billy Preston. I'm surprised there hasn't been some kind of documentary up to this point, mm -hmm. considering, you know, what a history that man has had in, in music. Jude Kessler is known for having written a series of books on the life of John Lennon that are thoroughly and exhaustively researched. Her new one is volume five in her series called Shades of Life Part One, and it covers the period of January through August of 1965. She plans on having nine volumes out to cover John's entire life. And you can look to my website where I'll be giving you the chance to win a copy of Jude's book with my latest special contest, um, which is going on right now. And our good friend and colleague, Owen Lynn, who has been on my YouTube page, Ken Michaels Radio, a few times, has a new book coming out on George Harrison titled George Harrison in the 70s, which will be available on paperback on March 22nd next year. A few more news items here. According to the always excellent Facebook page, The Beatles in Print Together and Solo, a new book is due out next March called Lennon, The Mobster and the Lawyer, How John Lennon Took Down a Music Industry Gangster by Jay Bergen. Bergen was a New York trial lawyer for 45 years. He represented John Lennon in his protracted court battle with Morris Levy, the notorious mafia frontman working in the New York City music industry in the 1960s and 70s. Over the course of the trial, Lennon and Bergen became friends. The trial stemmed from discord over an oral agreement where Lennon would record three rock and roll oldies from the 1950s that Morris would sell on a worldwide basis. The trial was finally resolved in 1977. Levy lost to the tune of $151,000, roughly, it says here, $727,000 today. Hmm. Bergen says it's a terrific story. It's John's story. It's never been told. There have been articles written here and there, but nobody's gotten it right because nobody had the contact that I did with him. The book will feature extensive court transcripts alongside Bergen's personal memories of Lennon, 
such as their shared love of 50s rock and roll. That definitely sounds interesting. As we know from time to time, Beatles songs crop up in TV commercials, the latest of which is from Me To You, which you might have heard in uh, TV commercials right now for Coles, not the Beatles recording of it, someone else recording it, a female singer in this case. We note the passing of journalist Maureen Cleave, who wrote for London's Evening Standard and a name that will forever be tied to Beatle history. It was Cleve's interview with John, which caused an eruption in the US when John said that the Beatles were more popular than Jesus, which led to boycotting and burning of Beatle records, particularly in the Bible Belt. It was said that John had claimed to have had an affair with Maureen, which inspired the Beatles song, Norwegian Wood, although John also said he couldn't remember who the song was about. However, Maureen said he made no pass at her. She wrote not only for the Standard, but throughout her career also for Telegraph Magazine, uh, Sega, and an Intelligent Life Magazine. Uh, Maureen was 87 years old. I thought Norwegian Wood was supposed to have been about Robert Freeman's wife. I've heard that too. Yeah. But it's also been written elsewhere that it could have been about her. But like I said, she denied it. We're happy to report that Billy J. Kramer is back on the concert scene, as he'll be doing a show at the Warehouse in Amityville, Long Island, on November the 23rd. Concert time is 6 p.m. He'll be joined on stage by Joe Rafano of the Liverpool Shuffle. Glad to hear that since he just lost his wife not that long ago. And uh, finally, the first announcement has been made that the Fest for Beatle fans is on for April 1st, 2nd, and 3rd at the Hyatt Regency on the Hudson. So far, the guests that have been announced include Greg Bissonette, Billy J. Kramer, Lawrence Juber, Dan Daneman of The Circle, Mark Rivera, and Chris O'Dell. Always check the Fest website for all the latest information at thefest.com. And you can also watch a brand new uh, episode uh, I just did on my YouTube channel with the founder of the Fest, Mark Lapidos discussing how the fest got started and many of the special guests he's had through the years. Okay, again, that's Ken Michaels Radio, my YouTube channel. All right, was that enough news? <laughs> Not bad, but um, <laughs> did you mention the, uh, <laughs> uh, the clip of um, I've Got a Feeling that was released from Get Back, from the Get Back film? No, I haven't, because ah, I haven't well, seen they, it. <laughs> they release their, you know, their what they they're calling their first clip from, and it's you know as a as, as a teaser, but it's not, you know, just a, a, a trailer. It's it's just that performance of a, a early rehearsal of "I've Got a Feeling," um, and it's really kind of interesting. I mean, it's it's uh, at the point where Paul is still calling out the chords in between the lines yeah. and counting in cues and things like that. Um, but if you watch it, you know, and uh, particularly, you know, if, if you're a musician, you, you would notice this immediately, but everybody's eyes are on, you know, on Paul, I mean, especially Ringo, you know, Ringo is watching extremely closely as Paul's running through this and he's playing, but it's, you know, this is a new song for all of them. So, so they're all, so they're, they're all looking really closely and it was really interesting to see and spectacular quality. Oh yeah. That's yeah. the one that that's really the thing that immediately is such a pleasure with the clips and will be about the whole movie is the quality of the uh, quality of the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can see it in the trailers. It's just so yeah. sharp, the picture. Like we've never seen it before. So mm -hmm. vivid. You know? Oh yeah. You compare that to the Let It Be movie <laughs> when it came out on VHS, it's like night and day. So if I could just kind of just add a little tag to the end of the news. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we were talking about this before we began recording. Passing yeah. Bram Edge uh, of the Moody Blues. Uh, the only member of the Moody Blues who was with the band for their entire history. There from day one when the band came together. And it was his retirement in 2018 that basically spelled the end uh, for the band. Um, and which, which is sad because they had sort of stopped touring over the past few years. And you just got a sense with Justin Hayward and John Lodge off doing their own 
solo tours. And I know John Lodge has a new album coming out that uh, either there was some sort of internal squabble within the band that ended it or something else was going on. And I never heard that Graham Edge had retired in 2018, but that's when he did. And that basically was the end of the Moody's. And I think he was diagnosed with cancer not that long ago. Could be wrong about that, but I think I saw that it was uh, it was a, a diagnosis this year. So, um, and he was 80. And of course there's the connection that not only was Graham Edge an original member of the Moody Blues, a founding member, but Denny Lane was as well. Uh, so, you know, they were bandmates in, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame together as Moody Blues members. And of course, part of the British invasion in 1965, the Moody Blues were on the NME uh, uh, awards concert. Mm -hmm. uh, they shared the bill with the Beatles and the Stones and the Kinks and a whole bunch of great acts. So very sad to hear. I did see the Moody Blues, by the way, because they had a 50th anniversary tour for Days of Future Past, and I got to see right. that, and it was wonderful. I've seen oh, them in concert many that. times. Yeah, yeah, they, they put out a live album, live version of that. And yeah, I, I've saw the Moody Blues a number of times, and I've seen Justin Hayward and John Lodge in recent years solo, uh, and they were a favorite band of mine. Um, and Mike Pinder, of course, former keyboard player, Another original member, of course, has crossed paths into Beetle, uh, Beetle Land uh, mm -hmm. by playing keyboards a little bit, uh, some keyboards on the Imagine sessions. Uh, or I, I assume he played keyboards, may not have may have played, done something else. But uh, he He's was in one the credits, the, I know. You know, He's one of the credit. many people who kind of was, came in and contributed to Imagine. Right. Um, so. Um, very sad to hear. Rest in peace, Graham Edge. Yes. Okay. Okay, so time to move on to the lyrics book. Mm. Um, we have the physical one here. This is the American edition. The British one looks a bit different. This is the electronic edition, um, which mm. I got because um, um, you can take notes in it without ruining the book. <laughs> Great, you know, <laughs> so, uh, you know, plus you can look up things, um, you know, do a search, very handy. You have to have both. Well, you have to have both if you're writing a book about <laughs> 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 um, <clears throat> Yeah, so what to say about this thing? I mean, I think um, one thing that became clear during the November 5th talk uh, was a bit more about what this book is because it, it was promoted as a kind of autobiography, but it really isn't an autobiography. There's an awful lot of autobiographical stuff in it, but um, you know, many people have pointed out things that they're disappointed not to see. For instance, um, you know, there's basically no mention of, of Heather and that whole era. Um, and therefore, only I think a couple of songs, maybe one song from um, uh, you know the the counting album, <laughs> driving, driving rain, um, <laughs> um, and uh, uh, he talks a lot about his parents, not an awful lot about his brother, a little bit about him, um, doesn't talk about his kids much. Um, and the thing is, if it were an autobiography, you might expect that, but. It's not actually an autobiography, despite his saying, this is as close as I'm gonna to get to an autobiography. Actually, as close as he was gonna to get to an autobiography was many years from now, which wasn't his book. It wasn't really an autobiography, but because its format is interview, um, you have Paul talking at great length about a lot of things. And um, so I think maybe if you want a Paul autobiography, you gotta take these two together many years from now and this. And even so, you'll hear an awful lot about the Beatles era and an awful lot less about the post Beatles era. Fortunately, Adrian and I are going to be covering the post Beatles era in our book. So um, if, if you have a hankering to read about that, stay tuned. Hmm. Um, he covers 154 songs. Uh, this is done out of um, five years of interviews with Paul Muldoon, the poet. 
um, and Paul Modun was at the November 5th interview. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, they, they arranged them alphabetically. Um, I think if it were up to me and I wanted to present it as the closest I was getting to an autobiography, I, I probably would do them chronologically. Um, but there are probably some benefits to alphabetical, you know, in, in a way it's like uh, putting your, your iPod on shuffle. Remember iPods? Those are now antiquated, <laughs> um, you know, uh, because it, it goes through all different kinds of periods within the alphabet. So um, it goes back and forth. Uh, and that, that must have made for an interesting editing problem for them because he's being interviewed over the course of five years talking about all these songs. And because it's alphabetical, it doesn't really go from, you know, chronologically from one topic to another. And so when things are mentioned that have been mentioned before, they had to sort of make sure that that was woven together properly, uh, which generally speaking, it was, there's not that much repetition. There's a little, not too much. Um, but why don't we start with general impressions? Um, start with that with, uh, well, start with Darren. Um, it's a great book. It's a great book to uh, get lost in the songs. Um, and it's a lot of the read is interesting. McCartney's memory is maybe not so much as memory is shaky. His tendency of being vague at times when you would like more detail you know, we're, we're, we're hardcore fans. We actually know more about him than he does. That's evident. Uh, but there's a lot of points in there where Paul's uh, memory is vague or he's intentionally being vague. And Alan, you pointed out that there's um, very little mention of his children, uh, no mention of his second wife. Um, well, that happens in a couple of other parts in the book. Like there's I was reading the, uh, and what I did with it, because a book of this size, I just find it easier sometimes to just sit down and flip around, you know, flip through the pages, find things at random, jump around, uh, and not necessarily a book this size, page through it in one, you know, from, begin, from page one to page what, 800, whatever. Um, uh, but in his section about Give Ireland Back to the Irish, uh, he talks a lot about the Sunday, uh, the Bloody Sunday incident and how he wrote the song and the record company said, Paul, it's going to get banned. I'd rather not release this. No, I want to release it. OK, stuff we sort of knew already. But he was sort of kind of like elusive to the fact that it was his first wing single. And he then eventually towards the end got to the point that Henry McCullough was Irish and it was a bit of an issue because he was from Northern Ireland about, um, you know, the song. And uh, Henry took some flack, I think, from uh, people he knew, friends or family, about being involved in this song. Um, but there didn't seem to be much like... The, his name and who he was was almost like the afterthought of the story. You, just, you understand what I'm saying? He doesn't... Um, I think another point, maybe a better example than that, was Junior's Farm, where he's talking about, um, you know, taking wings to Nashville. Uh, and what I learned was a simple little tidbit of information that the trip to Nashville was meant to, for the band to bond. We lost two of our members before we went to Africa, and we had two new guys in the band now. Uh, so we were getting to know each other. I mean, yeah, you know, Paul, could you have like, I mean, you do remember their names, don't you? I mm. mean, there was a little bit, of, you know, a vagueness there uh, that I find found a little frustrating. And there's other parts he talks about come and come, come and get it. And how he wrote, come and get it for Badfinger and explained um, almost like uh, the Badfinger was this band that we signed to Apple. Like, I think they were called the Ivies. I not, don't remember if they were the Ivies or Badfinger when we signed them, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, one of the guys in the band was a really nice, really nice guy, great songwriter. 
Pete Ham and he would just the recollection is either overly vague and it 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 it, it makes me wonder why is he being so vague? Is it intentional? Or uh, you know, this is a lot he has to remember, understandably. If he if if it's if there's stuff there that he's just doesn't recall, then what else is missing from this type of book? It's almost as if he needs an Alan Cozen, seriously, no joke, to sit down with him and guide him through his memory and ask the questions, uh, ask the specific questions and look for the specific answers. There was a lot of vague in, in, in the book, which can get frustrating, like I said, because it makes me wonder what else is either being overlooked that I would find interesting and I'd like to know. On the other side of the coin, there's a lot of cool little facts and, and you're bound to learn something that you didn't know, uh, just flipping a few pages. I made some notes, if that's okay, if I could just cherry pick a few things. Uh, as they're recording, hey Jude, <laughs> it's just the visual is funny to me. Before, as they're kicking into the song, Ringo went off to use the toilet. Mm -hmm. came back right in time to join without missing a beat uh to the session to you know to pick up his sticks and play um i found uh i found it interesting that paul was interested in birds and birding especially when he was younger because he talks about jenny wren uh so that was a little peek into something else that paul um you know paul likes to do or liked to do maybe probably still does today uh he uh, talks a little bit about how the sergeant major that he's referring to in Jet is actually his father-in-law. Um, <laughs> he says the Queen Elizabeth was, uh, was quite a babe uh, in, uh, when he was younger, and she was just, uh, uh, I was going to say coming into office, but that's not how, how it <laughs> works. She didn't get elected to office. But when she was younger and he was a boy, how he thought she was a hot babe. Um, the photos, I found some of the photos really uh, a, a little more uh, um, attention grabbing than some of the content. Uh, seeing things like uh, a picture of Paul's makeshift studio at his farm in Scotland, which I'm assuming is the same farm when he records at his studio in Scotland. I'm assuming it's all the same place, but in the late 70s, it was called the Spirit of. Ronakin, is that how you pronounce Ron it? Ronakon. And I'm assuming that's the same as where Wings were in 71. And I could be wrong. He but... had a couple of little studios up there. That, um, <clears throat> and he had different buildings and even different properties. Uh, and okay. and, and Ronakin was, was one of the properties he acquired a little bit later uh, okay. after. So after... it's not yeah so um so i yeah, remember spirit of ronicon i remember hearing that he used for back to the egg back to the egg and i'm trying to remember prior to that the photos they rehearsed photos. there they rehearsed there before i think i think they rehearsed there before uh yeah the run and there are hmm. a couple of photos at least of paul recording what would become mccartney too um in 79 at that same studio and just Found it fascinating just to take a little peek into Paul's life. The studio was a dump and it was sloppy and you just don't expect that. And I found that fascinating looking at the boxes, looking at his equipment crates with his name on them and, uh, and, the, and the great photo of him playing drums with the snare drum in the toilet, um, uh, which is also from that period, 79 and McCartney two sessions. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, a picture taken last year of Paul sitting in Helen Wheels. He still has the Land Rover. Um, those are the little pleasures that jumped out at me in the book. And the frustrations, again, are, like Alan said, really, in a nutshell, um, what might be missing and also what might be inaccurate. If he's trusting his memory alone, you know, you just get that impression there are some inaccuracies around and there's a lot of information you'd like to know that's not there. Um, 
and 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 his phrase about bad finger he didn't want bad finger to screw up come and get it he wants bad finger to cover come and get it as he wrote it because it was a hit he kind of sounds like he wrote it in a sort of formula that this was a guaranteed hit song he says i didn't want them to improvise or screw around because i didn't want bad finger to cock it up is how he put it in the book so now i have my new favorite phrase um so all told, it's a must, it's an absolute must have. And it is loaded with the little bits of information. Uh, for me, they were very little bits of information that just are little pieces to the big puzzle of who Paul McCartney is uh, kind of behind the scenes. He likes to drive. He wrote, um, what song was it? That in the middle of the night, he got up and tiptoed to not wake up Linda and Heather, the uh, Linda's daughter and closed all the doors to quietly come up with and now I don't remember what song um, hmm. if it was junk or something it was at that very early end of the Beatles beginning of the uh, solo stuff period hmm. but those little snapshots those little peeks into his life are what I really took away from you know the initial uh, initial readings of the book okay Ken? Interesting. Well, a lot of what Darren said, I do think that this book is, is indispensable, uh, mainly because for many of the songs, you hear information that you never heard before. And in some ways, I'm a little bit alarmed at that because if you're dealing with Beatles songs and these songs are more than 50 years old, you would have thought that you'd have heard Paul talk about these songs and, and some of the information that's given. Um, but at the same time, I'm someone who thrives on little nuggets of information about specific songs. And it's scattered all throughout um, this entire book. Uh, I think one of the things I love most about this book is that it gives you a window as to how Paul's brain works and how he puts together the songs that he does. He can get random thoughts from anywhere and put it into the song. And I was surprised to learn with his solo music, how much he sometimes took from memories of the Beatle years and put that into his songs. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, one thing I found fascinating was with um, Confidant. There's a line in there about uh, your reflected glory I could dream of shiny far off lands where serpents turned to bits of string and played like kittens in my hand. There's that line there in the song, which was actually a memory that Paul had from being with the Beatles and the Maharishi in India and learning transcendental meditation. And there was a guy there who had trouble meditating because he kept on seeing a snake in front of him. And, and uh, the Maharishi had said to him, just, you know, concentrate on meditating and it will turn into a bit of string. So just memory, just remembering that and putting that into the song, you'd never know that otherwise where he got that from. But, you know, his mind works like, like nobody else, <laughs> how he puts together the lyrics of songs. And, um, you know, I loved hearing about the kiss of Venus and that the planet Venus circles around the earth and at times that it, it's very close. So he's, he's phrasing it, this is like the kiss of Venus to the earth, um, things like that. Um, and like I said before, I'm surprised how much he draws from memories of the Beatle years a lot. Um, the most disturbing thing that I find about this book is not what Paul says, it's what he leaves out. And like you said, Darren, um, you go through all the different songs here and there's mention of the Beatles, there's mention of his parents. You don't hear him mention the other members of Wings at all. And even in a song like Mull of Kintyre, I mean, my God, <laughs> that was the biggest song they had in the UK. He wrote that with Denny Lane. Denny Lane is not mentioned at all when discussing Mull of Kintyre. Mm -hmm. um, I'm pretty sure I have to double check. I don't think there's one song that he wrote with Elvis Costello in there. You know, someone who 
you know, for a period of several years, was a serious songwriter with Paul. No mention of him. When it comes to Wings, and I've said this for many years, I, I feel like when he looks back at Wings and he talks about Wings, he'll say, we did this, we did that. He doesn't say Denny Lane's name. He doesn't mention the other members of Wings. He mentions him and Linda, <laughs> you know? And I find that really disturbing at times. But at the same time, you'll learn a lot about him as a person. Um, you mentioned the fact that he likes driving, uh, Darren. Um, when he discusses goes from the past, he talks about how much he enjoyed working with, well, he mentions Carl Davis, <laughs> okay, when discussing that, that piece of music. But he liked the fact that he had to leave his house and go for a half hour drive to go to the studio and work with him. Because he said that if he had a studio in his own house, he'd never leave it. So this gives him a chance to free his mind, take a break, go for a ride. You know, I find that really interesting. And as was pointed out in that, that interview on November 5th, how much, you know, buses come into play in his life and his imagination gets stirred up. He comes up with ideas when he's riding on a bus, you know, the top level of a bus, even, you know, it's um, all those little things trying to get into the mind of Paul McCartney and, and understand where certain lines come from. And not only that, you know, and I hate to admit this because I'm not alone in thinking when Paul started talking about Blackbird during the 1989-90 tour and how it was related to the civil rights movement and black women and their struggle for freedom and all of this. And I never thought that about the song. To me, the song was just about a bird trying to break free, you know? And for so many years, these were like innocent songs to me. And yet specific lines that he puts in these songs have more meaning than I ever would have thought about. Um, Martha, my dear, starts off being a song about Paul's sheepdog, Martha, that it morphs into a person. And then he mentions when discussing the song, that one of his relatives was unfaithful in a relationship. So it had to deal with that in the song. Okay. Um, what's the line? When you find yourself in the thick of it, help yourself. To a bit of what is all around you? Right. I'm interpreting that as other people you can have a relationship with, you know, a romantic relationship with. I never would have thought that Yeah. in a song like that. I've, I've listened to this song all these years. I want to believe that there's an innocence about these songs. It's like, I want to hold your hand is about eroticism. <laughs> you know? Can't it just be about, you know, a boy and a girl and the boy yeah. just wants to hold the girl's hand? You know, well, the girl I, mean, wants I understand. <laughs> the thought that something was all about how, how it was, there was a, a current of eroticism in there. Um, you know, mm. the, the idea that, you know, hey, you got that something, you know, I think you understand. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's always sort of been in there, but it hasn't, it, it, it hasn't always been really clear. It was really clear when um, uh, Moving Sidewalks, the band that morphed into ZZ Top, did their cover of it. They did it as kind of a blues and kind of a slightly leering blues. And, and that brought that aspect of it out really clearly. Okay. The Beatles one didn't quite so much. They did it more as a, you know, the teenage, you know, kind of sound. So, so they but were disguising you, it, but they knew when, it was there. When you think about it, when I touch you, I feel happy inside, you know, you think about it. Yeah. It makes sense mm -hmm. in that context, but all the years growing up singing along with that song i wasn't thinking about that hmm. you know and all throughout the book there are there are um examples of that i mean um he's Many using doing drugs yeah whenever he mentions grass he means grass <laughs> so yeah. he but does it... mention in i'm um, carrying that it could be mm -hmm. a gun drugs it could be a woman who's pregnant mm -hmm. Yeah. And in London town, toot, 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 toot is about right. cocaine, 
where did this come from? I mean, he's the he's the songwriter. Who are we to argue with him? He's the one who wrote the song. And I know you said, Darren, that there's inaccuracies in here, but when it comes to the songwriting, unless there's something you can actually prove. Yeah. You know, when it comes to Lennon and McCartney, in most cases, there was one or two people in the room when right. those songs were written. So it's hard to to say that what he's saying is inaccurate, unless it's something that's really obvious. There's quite a lot of provably inaccurate things. Um, I mean, just for instance, too many people. Well, he, he, he paints too many people as his response to John's angry songs about him, the first of which was, how do you sleep? Um, but how do you sleep was a response to too many people. I mean, Paul's actually was the first of the angry right. songs between those two. And I don't know why he is claiming otherwise what he may be doing. I mean, he conflates a lot of things and which, you know, after at his age, uh, having lived that long, you do tend to conflate things probably, but I think he may be conflating it more with things like John's Rolling Stone interview right. than with songs. But he, he writes about it as if he's responding to a song. We had all these songs, you know, uh, about each other. And, mm. and, but, but his actually was the first and, and you know what, so what? I mean, he should own it. He was the first and his was, as he puts it, subtle. You know, I, I know I never I never heard it that way until John, um, shortly after it came out, gave more interviews pointing out this line and that line and what it really means and how it's aimed at him. You know, and at first I might have even thought, well, I, I think you're being a little sensitive there, you know, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it's true. Um, However, you know, that there's only there's too many people and John thought that backseat of my car we believe that we can't be wrong was aimed at him and yoko right he thought dear boy mm -hmm. or no. i think the yeah. fans think that dear boy was was aimed at uh at john and paul has refuted that right but i think that this whole thing is he gets the timeline wrong like you said he was probably yeah. thinking more about how john was slagging him off in the press prior to too many people well plus there's you know here's from the same chapter um just reading my annotated bit. <laughs> oh, you wrote on it. No, I'm kidding. No, this is the, uh, the whole story. The whole story in a nutshell is that we were having a meeting in 1969 and John showed up and said he'd met this guy, Alan Klein, who had promised Yoko an exhibition in Syracuse. And then matter of factly, John told us he was leaving the band. That's basically how it happened. It was three to one because the other two went with John. So it was looking like Alan Klein was going to own our entire Beatles empire. I was not too keen on that idea. Well, I mean, I guess in a nutshell is the operative phrase there because talk about conflating. I mean, John showed up at a meeting and said he'd met this guy, Alan Klein, in, well, actually, he says it during the Let It Be sessions, but Paul's not at that one. So Paul might have heard about it first at a meeting in February. Um, <clears throat> and then John doesn't just then say he's leaving. He says he's leaving in September, which is quite a long ways away. Um, so, you know, when he says in a nutshell, I mean, to, to have that all in one sentence as if, you know, it happened that way, it's, it just struck me as kind of weird. Um, and I was thinking, you know, Darren said, he, you know, should have someone like me there. Uh, I was thinking more in terms of like Mark Lewison, you know, Mark, when Mark Lewison worked for him um, as editor of Club Sandwich, um, he, knew that Mark had sort of obsessively chronicled every minute of his life. Um, and, you know, you would see Paul in interviews saying things like, yeah, a friend of mine told me that it was like really, uh, you know, 23 years 
and 12 hours ago today that I played in this same hall. And you knew that that was Mark telling him that, you know, mm. and I, I have a feeling that, you know, I mean, I think I might have said the same thing about when we talked about the Rick Rubin show, you know, if I think if he had had Mark there interviewing him either with Paul Muldoon or instead of Paul Muldoon, that a lot of the chronological things would have been clarified before it went to print. Mm -hmm. You know, and he seemingly wasn't. I haven't asked him, but his name isn't in any of the acknowledgments or anything like that. So um, he talks about how the MPL crew did some research for it, but um, it's it's kind of hard to imagine anyone did research uh, because there are so many things that are um, just chronologically problematic. Um, I can't, you know, I can't talk about, let me put it this way. Um, an awful lot of the songs that I researched and Adrian did for the first volume of the book have problems in this book. And a lot of the ones that I haven't researched don't have problems, but I have a, a terrible feeling that once I start researching them, those problems are going to crop up. Mm -hmm. Um a lot of them are chronological um, and, and there, there are just things that, you know, Paul has to know. Paul knows aren't really quite true. Like, for instance, he must know that too many people comes before how do you sleep? You know, he has to know that. Maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Maybe he's forgotten. Maybe it's all become sort of tangled in his mind. But that's, again, why I say that the, the autobiographical aspect of this is not the most important part. Right. Um, what I found really interesting, apart from, you know, some of the things that you and Darren, you can, and Darren have mentioned, mm -hmm. um, like, you know, the, <laughs> the ornithological stuff <clears throat> and the driving and the buses and, and all of that. To me, a lot of the interesting stuff was when he talks about songwriting technique. You know, I often like to, you know, have a verse and then do something different in the second verse. And, you know, he's, he's talking actually about a lot of technical stuff that you could, if you were, if you were at his, you know, Liverpool Institute of the Arts, of Performing Arts, um, and taking a, a songwriting class, you could actually read a lot of these things and say, okay, as an exercise, I'm going to do what Paul says he does, you know, and come up with some interesting stuff. Um, you know, there's uh, some days, for instance, in, when he talks about the lyrics to some days, he talks about sort of, you know, repeating the last two words of one verse as the first two words of the next verse does it a couple of times, you know, I mean, it's obvious sort of looking at the lyrics that he's doing that, but I kind of like hearing a songwriter say that he did it on purpose and this is why, and that it's a technique that he uses. And in some cases he goes back to other songs where he used the technique that he's discussing. That stuff to me was all really interesting, you know, um, just as a, a songwriting nerd um you know just one thing alan i i found it really interesting when he talked about goodbye mm -hmm. the song that he wrote for mary hopkin and that he said this is the only time when he has done this where there's a certain word where he intentionally repeats several times like the word leave and lonely and linger mm -hmm. several times in the song and mm -hmm. it, it was done on purpose that way you know, in that yeah. particular song. Yeah, I like you that. Know, uh, talking songwriting, you, you rem reminded me of what I uh, read about him uh, talking about Jet. And sometimes in a lot of Paul's songs, and we've discussed this in past shows, sometimes his nonsense lyrics seem to be sort of like um, maybe off the cuff. And he could have, if he really buckled down, might have write, written a tighter lyric to a song or something. But hearing him describe how his mind was working, uh, and in this case, coming up with Jet, uh, and starting the song off with a powerful shout, Jet, as an ear-catching uh, tool to get people's attention to it. Uh, and then, like, Sergeant Major, well, that was his father-in-law. You know, so he took, he's taking these pieces that 
when he's explaining how he's doing it, you're like, oh, okay, I can understand that. Now you put them all together into a lyric. And although it's kind of abstract, it makes a little sense listening to it without knowing that you think, what's he talking about? Sergeant major and um, mater. And, um, and he explains it and you hit some of the, uh, some of these songs he really does, like you say, Alan, do a great job in talking about uh, the, his craft. Mm-hmm. and where his mind was and what he was thinking about when he pieced what might have been lyrics that you would thought, oh, Paul, you couldn't do better than that, now has a whole different look and it feels different and you understand how his mind was working when he wrote them. So that, those little insights, you know, uh, are buried in, uh, uh, in those pages as well. Mm-hmm. A lot of it seemed to be just sort of free associating, which is kind of interesting. I mean, in, in, in a way, it, uh, it had the quality of, like, as if you're in a conversation with him and he's just telling you this stuff off the cuff and going from subject to subject. Um, and that's, you know, that's, that's often really interesting and um, often revealing about, you know, stuff he thinks about and the way he thinks and, and that kind of thing. If you want to know about the songs, um, that can be a little frustrating. I mean, I looked up, you know, having written a book about I Want to Hold Your Hand, I naturally looked up I Want to Hold Your Hand probably first when I got it. And while I was pleased to see that, um, you know, I didn't get it completely wrong when I talked about it, you know, when I sort of stressed the eroticism in it in the book, um, there was nothing else about the song. You know, not about, you know, how he wrote it. I mean, he talked about where he wrote it, but that's, that's you know, okay. But, but you know, this was a, one of those sessions with John um, at the piano in the basement of the Asher's house <clears throat> and invited Peter Asher down to listen to it. And, you know, there's probably a lot of good stuff about that and about, you know, th- th- there's a lot of interesting stuff in that song that's worth talking about. And he just never kind of got there. It, it just is, you know, I'd, I'd actually like to hear Paul Modun's tape collection from all these interviews, because there may be just stuff that he left out. You know, it may not be all Paul's leaving it out. It, it, it could be that it just didn't get into the manuscript. Who knows? Um, but, you know, that, that was the case with a lot of songs. You know, he starts talking about the song and then goes on to something else and something else and something else. And while all that stuff is kind of interesting, he never gets back really to the song. Um, yeah. Also wanted to say that, you know, Darren mentioned the illustrations. Um, there's some spectacular stuff in there. Oh yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Including um, there are, you know, in, in his, um, when he put out the deluxe Ram, he had uh, pictures of some of his tracking sheets uh, you know, handwritten track by track, who's on it, what's going on. And there were a few missing and two of the missing ones are in this book. Very handy for me. Love that. Um, <laughs> Cause we're, st- we still now have the editing phase and we can look at those tracking sheets and make sure that everything is, is, um, is correct. Um, he's got dates on them too, which is very handy. So um and How the manuscripts you? are always interesting, you know, like with George's I Me Mine, you know, you see the stuff crossed out and what he's written in instead. Um, I love that stuff. Mm-hmm. Do you see that, that with, um, there's a photograph of uh, the transcription of Helter Skelter's lyrics, uh, which were written by Mal Evans. Uh, and I mean, Written you know, down. Yeah, yeah, written down. Uh, yeah. He, he must have either been copying from a recording or Paul was reciting and uh, Mal was writing them down and you could see how many changes were made, uh, which I, you know, I, I didn't know there were that, I think were fairly significant changes to the lyrics in Helter Skelter. Um, so, you know, that's one visual that's terrific, that's gold when it comes to this book. It's also a, a, a picture of a set list, the Quarrymen set list, uh, mm-hmm. written by John, mm-hmm. which is like just priceless mm-hmm. to see that. 
Uh, in John's handwriting, here's a set list for the quarrymen, a quarrymen performance. So those are all over this book, you know. <laughs> well, that's one thing I, I commented on in my other podcast, that it, it not only applies to Paul, but certainly with John and George, how I'm so grateful that they saved their handwritten lyrics. And we can see them. We can see changes that they made. And if they crossed out certain things, they had a, a really good exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame of John's handwritten lyrics. And you can see clear as day if something was scratched out and if he was going to use some other word or a different name in there. And I find that stuff priceless. Yeah. At least they, they knew the value. They saw, they saw the historical value of these songs and that you know, it might be important to look at in the future. They knew that much. And we we witnessed that not just in this book, but in so many of um, Paul's archival box sets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> there was a comic version of that in one of the um, books that Monty Python put out in the early 70s. I can't remember the name of the book, but it was, um, you know, great manuscripts of, of you know, famous works or something. And they have one that is from Shakespeare. And it says like, eeny, meeny, mighty, mo," And that's crossed <laughs> out and over it is written, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? <laughs> you know? um, which I guess brings us to another topic in here, which is all of Paul's literary references. <laughs> yeah. um, I sort of had wondered a little bit about that, you know, how much of that is actually Paul Muldoon sort of, you know, leading the conversation that way. But, you know, um, and then I was thinking, um, when I interviewed Paul in 2007 about Memory Almost Full, um, he brought up Dickens once or twice and he brought and Dickens gets brought up a lot. Dickens and Shakespeare are the two that get mentioned a lot in here, but there are others, too. Um, and I think he I think he talked about some other literary stuff in that interview, too. And I, I remember thinking that I hadn't really heard him talking about that stuff that much and that, you know, maybe he was um, sort of trying to, uh, you know, get a, a, a different, um, to be characterized a little differently. I mean, no one says he's stupid or anything, but, uh, mm. you know, I think he wanted to sort of bring a little more of the intellectual thing in um, by quoting authors. And, but, but, you know, it seems given the amount that he talks about it in here, um, it seems pretty real to me. Um, I, I, uh, if, if he hadn't mentioned it in 2007, I might have, you know, wondered more, but, um, you know, that wasn't an interview with Paul Muldoon sitting there. So, um, you know, I think uh, uh, also the fact that he included a couple of um, sort of school, uh, great grammar school era compositions in there, you know, like, like essays about, you know, various non-musical topics that were actually kind of interestingly written, you know, for a kid, um, mm. you know, pretty, pretty well written, I, I thought, uh, uh, and, and showed that, you know, he, he actually had been more studious than he liked to say for a long time, because, and, and, and that's another thing that comes out in here, because there's a tension between uh, the intellectual stuff and the, younger Paul McCartney version of himself that still wants to be a little embarrassed about the intellectual stuff that wants to be, you know, wait, we were poor people, you know, we, we didn't, we weren't posh. Posh gets used a lot in here and not being posh. Um, and, and so on one hand, he wants to promote this, you know, we, we're not so hoity toity that we use big terms and we don't want to know what all the musical terms mean and all that stuff. But I kind of think he does know that stuff and it comes out. And when he's not sort of disclaiming it, it's really kind of interesting, but the fact that he's disclaiming it and claiming it at the same time in this book is, you know, it's another, he, he talks about being a Gemini. Uh, and even though he says he doesn't care much about astrological signs, I mean, he's talked about it before too in interviews and, you know, other people have pointed it out, but Geminis have this duality and, yes. and that's a good example of it. So you know, there's a lot, a, a lot, a lot of, um, 
you get a lot of information about him. You might not get the information you're looking for, you know, if you want it to be about the songs or if you want it to be about his feeling about people in his family or, or whatever, but you get a lot of information anyway, you know, other information and, and about the way he thinks and about the way he works. And that to me is, is particularly interesting. You know, I, I must say that um, when it came to, I think it was the end in the book, he starts off by saying that he was more into literature than John was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found that to be really shocking mm -hmm. for him to say that because, you know, John has looked upon someone, you know, loved Lewis Carroll, wordplay, all this other stuff. And I sometimes feel like he's competing still with John and the perception that people have of the two of them. Well, he so, always did that with the art, with him being into avant-garde art and stuff in the 60s. And, right. you know, has said, no, I was looking and into that. I was I was into that stuff first before before John. And we were, you know, like he's got to prove the point that, you know, it wasn't all John that was the cool uh, mind in the band. I did it all first. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just don't know. There's been all this talk about him, him being so concerned about his legacy. And so I did feel, and I don't want to argue with someone like him because who knows Paul McCartney better than Paul McCartney does. But there's this very concerted effort throughout this book to prove what, that he was into literature and quoting certain authors. And, um, you know, I, um, they, they brought up let it be that it's actually a line that was in Hamlet. Whether or not Paul knew that or not, you know, Paul Muldoon brings it up, but then you can also say maybe, maybe it was part of Paul McCartney's subconscious in a way, you know? Um, I don't know. I found it a little bit uh, disturbing when uh, A Hard Day's Night comes up and Paul says, um, Something about a long, a long day's journey into night was premiering around that time. So what's the tie-in between that and the song A Hard Day's Night? He's got to mention... Night. <laughs> I guess. You know, everything's got to be tied into something else in literature or plays or something. It happens quite frequently here. And on the one hand, I don't want to question him about it. Who mm -hmm. would know about his own songs? you know, than the man himself. But, you know, I also brought up before the things that he doesn't say. And I have no problem. I never had any problem, really, with him switching the, the songwriting credits over the years. But Ticket to Ride is one of the songs that's brought up in this book. And it's listed as a McCartney-Lennon song. And he offers no explanation as to why his name comes first. You know, we know that Paul apparently gave Ringo some instructions on what he wanted the drum patterns to sound like in Ticket to Ride. But as far as the actual composition of the song, why was he listed first? Well, he, he, he kind of presents that as something that he and John wrote together um, and mentions, you know, the town of Ride on the Isle of Wight. And right. they went there. And uh, if it's something they wrote together, um, maybe, you know, I, from his point of view, it's maybe more than 50% him. And, you know, for the sake of his book, he's, he's, he's claiming that one. I think, well, it seemed to me that all of the song Lennon McCartney songs are listed in this book as McCartney Lennon. No, they're not. Oh, wait a minute, are they? You have a you have. I don't have mine handy to just randomly. Uh, I doubt you. that. I doubt that. You know, he's not yeah, going to put a day in the life time, in there. It seemed like every every Beatles song that I would uh, stumble upon, if I if I looked, seemed to be all McCartney Lennon, McCartney Lennon. But I could be wrong. My feeling was that that was because he was choosing the songs that he particularly had the lead on, you know, the, the lead impetus to write the song or 
or wrote most of or whatever, <clears throat> which is why it's in the book. What do you okay. find? What? So far, it all says McCartney Lennon, and the ones that I'm thumbing. Through. Yeah. But. Which, which goes, which is an age old debate about Paul doing that. I mean, he, that was the case with the Wings Over America album, if I'm not mistaken. He right. reversed the songwriting credits. Right. You know, so this yeah. is an old, old argument. Should he be doing that or not? But every Beatles song that I recall uh, passing, and when I was going through the book when I first got it, the Lennon McCartney's are all McCartney Lennon's, mm -hmm. not just Ticket to Ride. <clears throat> but if the song was mostly yeah. John's, it probably wouldn't have been in the book, right? These are yeah, but still, for decades, it's, it's been a Lennon McCartney thing, and there's a perception, again, which we just talked about a couple of minutes ago, about Paul feeling that he needs to uh, prove that he was. Uh, you know, either he's proving that he's still equal to John or he wants to one up John, you know, and one way of doing that was to change everything that's McCartney, Len uh, Lennon McCartney to McCartney Lennon, even though for decades we've seen record labels and song books and whatnot that have, you know. Hmm. Please, please me is listed as Lennon and McCartney. John's name is first. Please, please me. It's Lennon McCartney. Mm -hmm. You know, and so for that some... matter, Yesterday, he has Paul McCartney, John Lennon, and, and you know, it could really just be Paul McCartney. I mean, be, yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, my point is uh, for this book, what I want to learn most of all are the songs and the compositions. And yes, the autobiographical stuff is great. Um, but like you said, he might. Alan, he, he'll spend a paragraph talking about the song and then he'll trail off on something else. There's too much of that. Although I love reading everything else that he's saying. But when it comes to Lennon McCartney songs, if he puts McCartney Lennon in there for a song that I don't normally associate as being more Paul than John, I mean, that's how I feel about Ticket to Ride anyway. Um, I'd want to know why. Yeah. Okay. That's all that I'm saying. You know, mm -hmm. a hard day's night, which is a song that's that's been in question. Um, I've always heard that once they decided that they were going to use that as the title of the movie, Walter Shenson asked the two of them to come back and write a song. And the next day they presented it. Was it all John that wrote it? Because usually if Paul sings a part of the song. I, I tend to think he wrote that part, the bridge of the song. So if he did that, that's fine. But is it more of a McCartney song than a Lennon song? I have to check and see how it's how it's listed here. But so when, I, I want to hold like, your hand as John Lennon, Paul McCartney here. You hmm. know, it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, I think it's one more uh, indication with this book that it's not to be an accurate reference guide if you're looking to songwriting credits because of what I mentioned earlier on, Paul's um selective memory whether he's doing it on purpose or it's just you know time or he, you know uh what uh, to me that the, the reason why i was wasn't uncertain was because i really didn't look at the songwriting credits it was more paging through and some would catch my eye and it just seemed like all i saw was mccartney lennon mccartney lennon mccartney lennon uh i may have and i don't have it i didn't write anything down here couple of instances where um, a wing song was a, a Paul and Linda McCartney composition. And I'm like, I don't recall Linda getting a songwriting credit on this if you're going by the original record label or something, but hmm. giving Linda credit on this particular song. I don't have a good, I don't have where, I didn't write down where that is, but there seemed to be a lot of post Beatles stuff that was McCartney and McCartney songwriting credit. And I didn't real, it didn't occur to me that Linda really contributed. You know, we know the songs on Ram and wildlife that are both. I was surprised, for instance, speaking of the, the uh, Linda collaboration that um, in the entry on another day, he doesn't discuss that at all when he was sued about that. 
you know, um, because the publisher wasn't buying that Linda contributed. Um, nothing about that, not a word. Um, and that was a significant lawsuit. It, it was, you know, it, it, it led to some other interesting deals. Um, and, uh, you know, with, with uh, Lou Grade and, you know, how they finally came to terms and everything. I mean, he doesn't necessarily have to go into all the contractual stuff, but, you know, the fact that this was being held up as their first collaboration and that it was a real collaboration and he doesn't say anything about her input, even, even stuff he said before, like, you know, the pockets of the raincoat was supposed to be Linda's line. Um, or one of Linda's lines, but it was the one he always, uh, you know, gave as, as an example, something she came up with. Um, nothing, nothing at all. Nothing about um, how it even became a song, which is a really interesting story that I'm afraid you'll have to wait a year for. <laughs> <laughs> I found it interesting in that song that he, he talks about the sound of five. Hmm. which was a radio program where people would call in and discuss their, their personal problems. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking that this is the song, this, this woman is in her office. She's a secretary or a receptionist and she's doing her work until the five o'clock hour, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? So it, that's what it always sounded like to me. Mm -hmm. So it's these little things like that, these tidbits of information that you never realized before. And now we're fi finding out now, yeah. but that's then, a little bit like, um, you know, like as Americans, we're at a slight disadvantage with a lot of this stuff where, you know, time for tea and meet the wife, hmm. you know, I mean, it wasn't until many years after Sergeant Pepper was released that I found out that meet the wife was a, a TV show, you know, so th this reminded me of that, actually, the sound of five, you know. And also, um, you know, there are certain things that we've heard about in Beatle history when it comes to certain songs that Mal Evans helped to write some of the words for Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band or for Fixing a Hole. Fixing a hole. And um, the George Harrison, I'm, I don't know if it's true that he came up with the line, I'll look at all the lonely people and Eleanor Rigby. I'm not saying that it's Paul's job to, you know, fill in the holes for all these different things, but it'd be nice to know if he's talking about Eleanor Rigby as he is in this book, that he tells us everything there is to know about Eleanor Rigby. Mm -hmm. And now he has this, this new story that we never heard before mm -hmm. about this old woman that he used to visit when he was a kid and do errands for and have conversations with. And he enjoyed having these conversations with this old lady and that was part of the inspiration for Eleanor Rigby. Mm -hmm. I can understand how some fans would think, why haven't we heard this before in all these years and then start to doubt Paul? Maybe Paul thought this wasn't interesting enough to bring up. <laughs> I don't know, but we're hearing well, about a lot of things. Or mm -hmm. this was the story or fact that he wanted to share at this moment in this context not maybe some things that we knew about the particular song from the past there's a few things going on in eleanor rigby paul shares this one not that one that one we know mm -hmm. you know that could have been and, and not that he did it so that i won't tell them what they already know i'll t it just the way i think paul worked worked it with this book the story he chose to tell well, the story that Paul Muldoon chose to include yeah. in the manuscript, you know, there's a lot of right. variables. I found well, it really interesting with A Day in the Life that the only thing that Paul really talked about was that he loved the audio library at Abbey Road and all the different sound effects that you could use. And he came up with the idea of the orchestral buildup in the song, but really nothing about the composition of A Day in the Life. Mm -hmm. And the orchestral buildup, I could be wrong. I thought it was George Martin's idea. Yeah, I was thought so too. Didn't they collaborate on that together? Yeah, but it I always thought it was the the idea was a was George Martin's. Why don't we try this with, you know, an orchestra? Mm -hmm. I mean it could have been both. It could, they, they could have discussed two different, you know, things. Right. 
Anyway, I mean, it's in a nutshell, it's essential, it's indispensable. You do have to approach it, though, a little bit. And you'll, you know, the, you know, you'll find the parts that you, you'd think, hmm, you know, I don't know. Uh, and quickly forget that because there's where, the, where those questionable moments are. There are plenty that are eye opening pleasures, whether they're the photos or other little tidbits. Like, I don't know if uh, I knew that Jet was the name of a Shetland pony. It was not. It was not. <laughs> okay, I it knew was, it. Wait a minute. Wait. It was the name of that Shetland pony, but that Shetland pony had not been born by the time Jet was written. And in fact, they show the picture. And it says 1975. I, yeah, I noticed it. I thought it said, I said, there's another picture of one of his daughters on it. Yeah. And it says late 70s. And I'm thinking, wow, that doesn't fit. But OK. Um, uh, did ticket, but, uh, but was too many people written before the Shetland Pony uh, <laughs> was, bo was born? Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what John could be referring to. And how do you sleep now? I'm just kidding. Yeah. Um, Jet was not about a Shetland pony. It was about a different animal. So I can tell you. Okay. But the thing is that, you know, actually, Paul has, at the time, Paul talked all about what it was about. It's not like, you know, I'm making it up. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he talked about it quite a bit and, you know, told the story in, in great detail about writing Jet, you know, and, uh, it, it, it was about an animal, but it wasn't a pony. But, you know, you you um, you get the impression it could be about the pony uh, from, you know, the wind in your hair. And you get a, a visual of a, a horse racing, you know, um, but it, it, it wasn't. It was really something else. Anyway, it's funny oh. that you say that, though. I never knew that it was about a shell and pony. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. <laughs> it's about a rat that was living in the back of the uh... it was bigger than a rat and smaller than a pony what animal was it are you keeping that from it us until the book comes out it was what a was puppy it? a puppy mm. oh yeah okay so i remember him talking about that initially Jet the dog yeah. yeah yeah and then over the years it evolved into a horse um you know but they probably named that shetland pony after the song rather than vice versa. Okay. You know, now are these earth shattering errors that we, you know, have to feel like, okay, well, obviously he doesn't remember anything. No, and probably not, you know, I mean, I think it's just something when, like I say, got conflated, got, you know, mm -hmm. remembered differently. Um, but, you know, he did leave a, large record of what he was thinking at the time all through his life you know now he could have been making those things up you know those could be wrong and this could be right but i kind of think that uh the stories that he told at the time of composition are, are probably um pretty accurate mm -hmm. and uh yeah there was there was a bunch of that but uh like I say, the, the, the value in this book is, is really other things like the right. composition techniques and, and, and that kind of stuff and how he thinks about his music and how he, how he thinks about approaching composition, um, you know, and it confirms, it confirms a lot of um, things that always seemed sort of clear about Paul in a way that, you know, that he's like a workaholic in a way you know, that uh, the fact that his studio is, uh, you know, 20 or 30 minutes from his home just to keep him from really working 24 hours a day on his music, which he mm. probably is anyway. You know, you don't have to be in the studio to write a song. He talks about all kinds of places. He writes songs. <laughs> so, you know, there's and, and also the other thing that um, is kind of interesting and kind of confirms some of the stuff that we have in the book that really was just sort of the product of observation of, you know, an awful lot of stuff is, you know, the fact that he, that his mind is always open to everything around him. You know, he'll read an article in a newspaper 
and it might come out, you know, as a song, but indirectly, you know, you won't necessarily be able to peg it to that particular news thing, but elements of that story work their way into a song. And it might've been a few years later, you know, a lot of that. And, and um, it, it's just interesting that, you know, he's, obviously aware. I mean, people aren't always aware of how they write and what influences them. You know, they don't really have to be, they just have to do it. Um, but he's very aware of, you know, how open he is to all kinds of stimuli. And, uh, and that was another thing I found really interesting about the book that confirmed that. Uh, you hit the nail on the head there, Alan. I mean, that's the primary advantage in getting a book like this to get inside the mind of Paul and to understand his craft and how he comes up with the different ideas that he does and he's a very complex person a lot of things that he does that kind of contradicts what he says but the more that you study him the more you understand him or maybe you understand him less <laughs> for that season <laughs> I don't know but um yeah I also wanted to mention just a few things here that I didn't know about Let Them In. Sister Susie is really a reference to Linda because in Jamaica, they called Linda Susie, a white woman with blonde hair, <laughs> referred to as Susie. And so Susie and the Red Stripes, the Red Stripes came from a, a brand of beer. He actually says Brother Michael. Obviously, he has his own Brother Michael. It, it, uh, it's about his own brother, but it could be about Michael Jackson because the Michael Jackson was invited to the Venus and Mars party. You know, I, this is what he's saying in the book. <laughs> <That's all>. hmm. <laughs> um, you know, Lady Madonna, a tribute to a mother figure, obviously, but partly to his own mother. Wonder how you managed to, to feed the rest could be about, you know, Paul and his family, see how they run came from three blind mice. <laughs> but uh, that's also a play on words because he mentioned see how they run after he talks about stockings, stockings. Needed, needing mending. Yeah. So he loves to do all that, the play on word stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't talk about it. One of my favorite lines from him is mm -hmm. the opening line from Helen Wheels said farewell to the last hotel. It never was much kind of abode. Abode. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love when he does stuff like that. And all throughout the Beatles history, they did stuff like that. It won't be long till I belong to you, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there's a lot of fascinating stuff all throughout this book um, to make and it worth just, your while. Uh, if you have back issues, you'll want to get yourself in a nice position to, when you pick it up because uh, it's a hefty, hefty it is book. Heavy. It is eight pounds, according to Amazon, eight, po eight point something pounds. That's all. Um, and uh, made a lot of noise when I <laughs> put it down. Oh, you you got to be careful. Don't ding the corners. <clears throat> no, of course not. Um, I was a little annoyed. I have a little ding in the corner of mm. my book, but <laughs> these are things that irk me. <laughs> mm. Anyway, it's a must have. But definitely, but approach so. it, approach it, expecting the unexpected and not to deliver what you thought would absolutely be in there. Uh, and it's it is, but it really isn't autobiographical. <laughs> but Which the most the most disappointing thing for me is that after the Beatles, there were only a few people that Paul really wrote a decent amount of songs right. with. There was Denny Lane. There's Eric Stewart, who's not mentioned. Right. Even though Pretty Little Head is in the book. Mm -hmm. And Elvis Costello. I mean, you could hear about John Lennon all you want, but you never know that these other people wrote with Paul. And we're talking about 50 years, more than 50 years of his music. I, and I wonder, I'm sorry, Ken. Did I cut you off? No, that's all right. Good. I wonder if it's it's if, if it's a, just a, a means for him to avoid not crediting someone or, or leaving someone out accidentally. So just no names or no or, or vague on all uh, when it comes to all parties. 
Um, well, their names are listed in the book under the. No, I know that, but his, his, but in in the you know in his words when he's talking about Mullah Kintyre without mentioning Denny, right? Yeah, maybe it's just a means of not leaving any, anyone out. So I'm going to leave everyone out. Hmm. That doesn't make any sense <laughs> to okay. me. I mean, the, to me, this this should be primarily about the songs and the compositions and the work put into it it is called the lyrics you know i would have preferred if there was more time spent on the lyrics and the melodies Mm -hmm. again i don't mind learning about everything else in paul's life but that's what i really thought this book would be about really going heavily into the lyrics aspect of it the compositions yeah yeah but an interesting read Definitely. Oh, it's fascinating. And still, despite its flaws, it is it is a must have. Mm-hmm. OK. <laughs> I, I muted. Heavy heavy lifting. Great, great to work out with. I hope oh, that's right. I see. OK, so shall we consider this covered for this week? I think yeah. so. All right. So let's go around and give our contact information, um, starting with Ken. All right. You can email me at everylittlething at att.net. Don't forget, I have my relatively new YouTube channel called Ken Michaels Radio. There's all kinds of interviews. It's all Beatle discussions on on the YouTube channel. And most recently, I interviewed Mark Lapidus, the founder of the Fest for Beatle Fans. And we talk about the history, the early history of the fest, and some, we can only lightly touch upon some of the special guests that he's had through the years. And he talks briefly about the upcoming fest in April. And in addition to that, I had uh, the crew over at Talk More Talk uh, to do a show with me and just have some fun and each of us picking three songs that were not singles by the Beatles in the U.S. that we felt should have been that would have been major hits. That's a, that was a, a ton of fun. And most of us had completely different selections and I'm sure just about everybody watching the show can think of many songs that could have been hit records that weren't released as singles. Did there were, there were revolution nine. <laughs> no, but if you were in the show, you would have picked it. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the new Mary Jane probably. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But, it was interesting to hear their choices and a lot of people have written in so far to the YouTube channel about that. It is fascinating that for all the hits that the Beatles had in that short period of time in the U S from 1964 through the you know, half of 1970, they had so many hit records. They could have had so many more and there were albums for which there were no singles at the time, like Sgt. Pepper, for example, mm-hmm. um, or the white album. You know, or Rubber Soul, you know, even though individual cuts got airplay a lot on the radio, they were not released as singles in the U.S. We're talking about U.S. only. So that's a Ken Michaels radio. Um, Also uh, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, there's weekly Beatles trivia on there and you can win one of 10 great prizes every single week. And I do have a special contest going on right now to win Jude Kessler's latest book. If I have it here, yes, I do, called Shades of Life, Part One. This is Volume Five of Nine. There will be nine books all together, all on the life of John Lennon. And all you got to do is visit the website, kenmichaelsradio.com. On the home page, there's a link to my special contest page that explains how to win it. And um, I would say that's about it. Okay, Darren. Um, you can email me. Uh, directly at Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org. Uh, look for my two Facebook pages. One is Darren DeVivo. Uh, the other is Darren DeVivo WFUV DJ dot dot dot. Um, send, uh, follow me there or send me a friend request at the other or both, but I'm all over Facebook. And um, as for the radio, catch me on the air Monday through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. Uh, and on Saturdays from 1 to 4 p.m., Saturday afternoons, so five days a week. 
at WFUV, which is 90.7 FM in the New York area. You can listen uh, online, as Alan mentioned at the beginning of the show, WFUV.org. We have an app. Download that to listen. Uh, and uh, also, if I always bring this up, even though I really don't know if there's anyone that does all that much with the HD setting on your radio, the few that might have one. Uh, but um, in instances where maybe WFUV is broadcasting a Fordham University uh, college basketball game or football game, and we broadcast the game on the radio, 90.7 FM HD2 gives you uh, a connection to a secondary FUV. So um, I'd love for you to join us. So we're going to, I'm uh, currently putting together my list for my favorite albums and songs of the year, which the station always does that every year. Uh, so uh, I'm putting that together, um, probably finishing it up at uh, 5.59 in the morning on Monday when it's due at 6 a.m. Um, so check that out, check out everything and everything's wonderful and the lyrics and and what, don't forget, don't forget, just make, make leave a note, leave yourself a note, watch, get back. In case you forget. You, forget. you know, you, Alan, and Ken, don't forget. Um, <laughs> okay. Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What time? It's 9 p.m. begins? I saw Actually, I, I saw something where for Thursday, it will premiere at um, 12 midnight, but Pacific time. So 3 a.m. Eastern time on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> and my understanding is, just like with Hulu, once it's up there, you can... You can play it whenever you want. Wait, you totally blew my head off there. So they're going to show it on Thanksgiving twice at prime time and earlier in the day? No, no. Get Back will premiere on Thanksgiving Day at 12 midnight Pacific time. At 3 a.m. Eastern time. Okay, that's when. It, okay, it's the same thing. All right. So okay. once it's up there, you can keep playing it. But it's one, it's one episode per day. It's, oh, and, and that's just on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving and the next two days. No, no, it's I know that, but it's not like quick. Um, clear the table and put the dishes in the sink because at nine o'clock. It's supposed to be watch accessible the whole want, time. Yeah, right? once it's up. Once each episode is up, you should be able to watch it anytime you want. So if I you wake up at six... <laughs> it should be there yeah okay so if you want i thought you were um, watch it with somebody and somebody decides that they want to make a phone call and go off somewhere else you can still put it on when you're ready and that's my understanding my friends this is why in my house there aren't any sharp sharp objects they keep all of that away from me hmm. because i confuse easily mm -hmm. but not as okay, much as i so do but that's good to know so if you want to watch the football games on Thanksgiving, you can fit, get back in wherever you want it. Hmm. Really? What's more important? <laughs> get back is 10 times more important than the football games. Of so, of course. Can I mention one more thing I forgot to, to bring up before? My other podcast show, Talk More Talk. The next show is going to be next Monday, which is <clears throat> November 22nd at 9 p.m. Eastern. On our Facebook page, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast, we're doing something called Rack Our Brains. We did this once before. Each of us will come up with three questions to ask the other people on the show. They're not prepared for it. It's not trivia. It's all opinion related, but they have to come up with an answer on the spot. So it's a fun thing that we do every now and then. So that'll be, what's that? I thought you were going to turn it into something like Squid Game. If they get the question wrong, gone. That's not a bad idea, actually. Get the answer yeah. wrong, I mean. <laughs> so if you can, check that out next Monday, 9 p.m. Eastern. Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast on our Facebook page. Thank you. Okay. Um, so for me, um, the easiest way to get in contact with me is through Facebook. I've got two pages. Um, one is just Alan Cozen. The other is Alan Cozen Remixed. Uh, Alan Cozen remix tends to be more Beatle oriented and Alan Cozen seems to be sort of my other life um, <laughs> uh, or something. 
Um, we also have a uh, page, a, a Facebook page for the McCartney Legacy Project. So um, McCartney Legacy on Facebook. Uh, we periodically post some new stuff and also uh, news about the book and whatever um, occurs. You can contact the three of us at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com by email. Um, you can also find us on two more Facebook pages, just things we said today or things we said today, Beatles radio fans. It's kind of a Germanic name. I think Steve came up with that. Steve Marinucci formerly on the show. Um, <laughs> So things we said today, Beatles radio fans, things we said today. Um, we have a Twitter feed at things we said fab. Um, and you can find the shows. Well, you know where to find it because you're watching it um, on YouTube. If you get the video versions of the shows on YouTube, please be sure to subscribe to us. Um, you can get an audio version on Podbean or iTunes, uh, various other places. So that's how to find us. So for this episode of Things We Said Today, uh, it's been fun going through Paul's book, uh, fun having that as an assignment to read, because I was going to have to read it anyway. Thank you so much for joining us. And for Ken Michaels and Darren DeVivo, I'm Alan Cozen, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>